Well, welcome everyone um, to uh, today's Humanities in Action talk. Uh, before we begin, you'll notice that the name of the talk is Trouble at Carolina, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, what the university and our community has been through uh, the past two weeks. And of course, today, there was a lot of scrambling about whether we would do today's program or not. Um, and uh, so first of all, we want to just acknowledge the loss of our uh, dear colleague two weeks ago. And of course, just think about the trauma that our students, faculty, and staff are facing. And so again, it's a, it's a day where trouble at Carolina means two things, not only this wonderful talk we're gonna see, but of course, uh, the situ situation that we're in. So it's, it seems fitting to acknowledge that. Um, and of course, we can still continue to do what we do at a university, which is to foster these wonderful humanistic uh, experiences. So now I go to something that's, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Max, I'm Executive Director of Carolina Public Humanities, here we are at Flyleaf Books again. It's so great to be here. Um, before we begin, my dear friend, uh, Bob Kuykendall has something to say. Or at least the noise-making part of it. Thank you. Yes. So if you have noise-making devices, vuvuzelas or anything that you brought with them, please silence them. It's always important that the host silences it as well. And folks, if you're out there in the ether watching on your cell phone, please do not turn off your cell phone. I also want to thank uh, uh, many spots. Thank you, Bob, for that. Appreciate it. It's some of the last work he's going to do for us before leaving for Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. But maybe we'll have you come back every Wednesday to say that. Um, we also want to thank our sponsors, the Merca Baumberger Group at Morgan Stanley and the North Carolina Honor Society, who have been really very supportive of our K-12 programming. And our partner for this program and many of our programs, Carolina Alumni, uh, formerly the General Alumni Association, they're going by Carolina alumni now. Uh, folks, if you are not a member of the uh, association, you can join. You do not need to be a, an alum. And of course, you can get discounts to our programs um, and all sorts of wonderful perks uh, through that great association. We're so happy to be working with them. I want to thank our staff, Beth Gardner. Where's Beth? There's Beth. Put her hands together. Beth is one of our newest, actually our newest employee. Uh, and uh, so uh, Beth is our new events manager and is just doing already just fantastic work. So welcome, Beth, and thank you for being here. I also want to, of course, thank Paul Benici and Graham Hill, who are our tech guru, is making sure that you folks out there can see everything that's going on in here. Uh, also to our wonderful director, Lloyd Kramer, who is here. Thank you, Lloyd, for all that you do. Our advisory board chair, Sarah Gear. I know I saw her earlier. Where's Sarah? Thank you, Sarah, for your wonderful work. And of course, the Dean Jim White, who is here. Thank you, Jim. You've been here a year, and you've been to so many of our programs. We feel your support, and thank you so much. And thank you also for the work you did in your office today to making sure this program can indeed happen. Also, let's put our hands together for Flyleaf Books. All right, it's a true sign of a true sign of a air quotes civilization when you have a functioning independent bookstore that is such so wonderful like Flyleaf Books. We're so happy to be a partner of theirs for over a decade now, uh, doing all sorts of, of programming. So, again, thank you for coming today. Thank you for if you were at all affected by the events on campus today, you have our um, empathy and understanding with that. Uh, Quickly, I want to explain what Carolina Public Humanities is, who we are, and what we do. If you're not familiar with us, uh, we are the public outreach arm for the College of Arts and Sciences, and it's our job to make sure that the best scholarship and resources of the university are shared as far and wide with North Carolina's communities. Uh, we do that through, of course, these programs. We have our weekend seminars, and please stick around at the end of our discussion. I'm going to talk about some future programs for a few minutes, if you're interested, weekends, including weekend seminars. We, of course, have this series, Humanities in Action, which is about contemporary topics. We're thinking of changing the name to Humanities Hot Topics or something like that to make it clear what it is, uh, what we're doing here. Um, also, book groups right here in this very room, special events, including events at the Chapel Hill Public Library coming up later this month. And again, I'll mention those in particular at the end of our program. Uh, so here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to have our speaker give his talk. At the end of the talk, we'll have time for questions. Um, please raise your hand for questions. You will say your question, but give it me a moment to just paraphrase the question for our online audience so that they can hear it because they will not be able to hear what you are saying. And then uh, Dr. Mieser will answer your questions. We'll do questions from the online audience, folks. We have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. And again, I do want to remind you folks, we have great things coming up since we're so early in the semester and we have a lot of programming coming up. I do want to take, if you're interested in sticking around for just a minute or two, I'll go over some upcoming programs that we have. We'd love to see you at. 
Well, let's get right to what we're here for, this wonderful talk. And today's speaker needs no introduction, but it's my job to introduce our speaker. So uh, Dr. James Meeser is Chancellor of UNC Chapel Hill Emeritus. He was the Chancellor when I first came to school here as a grad student in 2002. And here I am introducing him. See, magic can happen at Carolina. Uh, as you will see in this talk, Dr. Meeser's tenure as Chancellor witnessed an era of growth and academic accessibility that are still paying dividends to the university today. Being chancellor of UNCCH is a challenging job, and I would like to suggest that Dr. Meeser's sensibility to the needs of student, faculty, and staff during his tenure come from his core identity as a musician. I might be biased in this assessment as a musician myself. He is an organist by training, an instrument with many levers, knobs, and pedals, and as we will see, it provides a fitting metaphor for running a public university. Dr. Meeser received a BA and MA in music from the University of Texas at Austin and pursued his doctorate in music at the University of Michigan. He enjoyed a long and distinguished career as an educator and performer before taking on the job of chancellor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And from there, he made his way to Chapel Hill in 2000 to lead the school as its ninth chancellor. At this point in the intro, if Dr. Meeser were presenting on something like organ music, I would give you a list of some of his accomplishments as chancellor at UNC, but that's the subject of this talk. So at this point, I will turn the stage over to him. It is an honor to welcome James Meeser as he presents Trouble at Carolina, the complex relations between UNC and state governments. Please put your hands together for James Meeser. Thank you so much, Max. Um, I want to thank Lloyd Kramer for the invitation to speak to you. And Max Orr is, has just done wonderful things, including these PowerPoints. I, I, I am, there's an old saying that power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> And I am uncorrupted. Uh, my PowerPoints, I, I, I made an attempt at slides, and they were all text. They were so boring. And Max has done a wonderful job of creating visual images for my, for, for my presentation. So I, I'm an, an enormously in your debt, Max. There is indeed trouble at Carolina. Uh, I arrived at this campus in 2000, as Max said. UNC was highly rated, but highly vulnerable. At, we were still teaching chemistry, a world-class chemistry department in a building that was constructed in 1925, Old Venable Hall. How many of you actually been in Venable Hall? You, you saw it, and you, you, you know what a disaster it was. I got lost in there many times. Um, it's, it, our world-class music library was in, a, was in the basement of Hill Hall. Um, the campus was definitely showing its age. We had a, a billion dollar deferred maintenance backlog. But there were many positive things about Carolina. The Lombardi report had just been issued. John Lombardi was the president of the University of Florida in Gainesville. And he mentioned he, he, he did an analysis of the major public research universities in the United States. UC Berkeley, Michigan, UCLA, and UNC. Florida was not even on the list, his own university. So we were, we were really good but we were, but we were highly, highly rated, but highly vulnerable. I think that UNC's distinction was not only, 
we were the first public university in America. Everybody knows that. But it was two private gifts that really set us on a different course. The Moorhead benefaction that established the Moorhead Scholars Program, which, which gave us the best students in America and the planetarium, not the, notwithstanding, and the Keenan gift, which established the Keenan Scholars, the Keenan Trust, which has been so good to us. When I arrived, there was another benefaction, a third benefaction. Julian Robertson had just created the Robertson Scholars Program for Duke and UNC, which put us on, the, on a par with a great private university. The, the Robertson Scholars Program recruits a class of students to both universities, and one of the one of the elements of that program is that students spend a semester, at least uh, at least a semester on the other campus. Julian noted that his two sons had had, had gone to. Duke and UNC respectively. And they had very different experiences. And he wanted to he wanted to combine those two experiences into one to give them an opportunity. And I I never I, I will never forget um, meeting with the Robertson the Duke Robertson scholars who were visiting who were on campus with President Cohan in my in the conference conference room in in south building and it was almost embarrassing because the the duke, the duke students were saying how much better the culture is over here i knew that the I had been provost at South Carolina and Chancellor of Nebraska before I came. And I had done major reallocation of resources to build what we called cathedrals of excellence among other otherwise mediocre universities. And I knew that that strategy would not work for UNC. Because UNC had very few weaknesses. It had, we were vulnerable because we had low faculty salaries, a huge deferred maintenance backlog, but we had a tradition of excellence, real excellence. I've already forgotten my slides. So that's 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 where I, when I began. There was reason for optimism in 2000 and the the reason for that was the higher education bond referendum which was on the November ballot in 2000. That bond referendum was a, was a grand coalition of the UNC system, the 58 college, community college system, and the business community. Led by, it was led by J.B. Milliken, who was vice president for public affairs at, at the UNC system. J.B. is now the president of the University of Texas at uh, at, all, uh, at the University of Texas system. And he's an old friend. Uh, I'm convinced that the bond issue, 
which by the way passed in, in 70, all 100 counties with a 75% plurality. It's the, it was the, the $3.2 billion construction bond, which is the largest construction bond, higher education construction bond that's ever been passed by any state to this day still stands. Carolina got $525 million from that bond issue. Every one of our projects was, was tied to fundraising. In my installation address, I said a bold thing. I held my breath and said we would triple the investment if North Carolina passed the bond issue. I didn't know where the, I didn't have any confidence that, that I was saying, what I was saying, but, but in fact, we actually quintupled the, the investment of North Carolina's citizens who supported the bond issue because they believe in higher education. I believe that fundamental fact. If we, if we just tell our story, the people will support us. So ultimately, we not only quintupled the investment, we raised $2.4 billion for academic support, 225 endowed chairs, 1,000 new scholarships, and we can quintuple the investment of North Carolinians. So we were highly ranked but highly vulnerable. Due to, a, due to low faculty salaries and this enormous deferred maintenance backlog. Yet I knew that we, the investment strategies I had tried at two other universities were not right for Chapel Hill. I've already said this, that reallocation was not the way to go. We would have a low tolerance for weak programs and we would move funds to support them. We, we couldn't have any weak programs because that's the nature of being a great university. I also knew that we needed an investment in big science. I couldn't afford to play, uh, to, to play in my own backyard of the arts and humanities if I were going to be if I was going to be the UNC Chancellor. I had, we needed a big investment in, in science and I needed a strong leadership team. I had, by the way, when I came, I was, I was the, the Chancellor had recently died, leaving a huge indebtedness. I had to find a provost, chief financial officer and a chief research officer. The cupboard was bare, but I, I saw this as an, enor an enormous opportunity to build a strong team. And so I recruited Robert Shelton from the University of California. He was the vice president for research of the UC system, had been chair of physics at UC Davis, um, I, I recruited Nancy Suttonfield to be the Chief Financial Officer, the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration from Case Western Reserve. And together, we recruited, Shelton and I recruited Tony Waldrop 
to be the vice chancellor for research. It was a very strong team. And we had an, an opportunity to invest in big science. Fortunately, fortunately, the capital construction program was front, front end loaded for big science to benefit the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Medicine, the School of Public Health, and the School of Pharmacy. Here's a secret. We drafted our faculty and prospective faculty to be planning teams for new, new facilities. The ability to dream about new facilities, new research environments, is the biggest retention factor and recruitment factor I know in higher education. And it worked. We were, we were also very fortunate in my first year to have 18 we, a, a huge, a huge unprecedented growth of new faculty lines. Um, and I dedicated 18 of these lines to genomics and genetics. A brand new field where, where, where UNC had no previous expertise. And we recruited Terry Magnuson, who was later vice chancellor for research, to be to head up this genomics enterprise. He came with his 15-member research team and 10,000 mice. He brought them with him. The reason Terry came is that we promised him a building. And he ultimately we built four for him for genomics and genetics. We are a world leader in today in that in that in that in that field. But we had no previous expertise in it. By 2003 UNC, the students joke that UNC stood for under construction. There were cranes everywhere. We built six million square feet of new buildings and miracle of miracles, we also created 20 acres of green space. How do we do this? by building parking structures. Vertical parking instead of, instead of asphalt parking lots. I had great faculty leadership when I was chancellor. Sue Estroff was the chair of the faculty from 2003, 2000 to 2003. The late Judith Wegner was chair of the faculty from 2003 to 2006. And Joe Templeton was the faculty chair from 2006 to 2009. One of the things I, I forgot to mention was that you, in my introductory comments about the quality of North Carolina, is that we have a really great faculty culture. I had, <laughs> I had had an experience at both Penn State and Nebraska and South Carolina, to be sure, where the best faculty stayed far away from governance. 
They didn't want to have anything to do with it. The situation was totally different at, at Carolina. The, we had great faculty in faculty governance. You could, you could easily, easily meet a member of the National Academy who was also a member of the faculty council or a faculty senate. That's part of, part of what I was talking about when I said this, this university has a, has a great cultural history, a great, great, a great culture. When I was chancellor, I had three main goals. Overseeing the massive construction project, respectful renovation, historically accurate renovation, and new construction. Second, student affordability and accessibility. And the third, faculty salaries. Those, those were the main three. In 2002, we constructed, thanks to the Pitt and, Pitt and Barbara Hyde, we constructed Hyde Hall on the most historic part of the campus. I was leading a visitor and talking about historic pre preservation and re renovation historic, respectful renovation. I was leading a, a visitor across McCorkle Place, the oldest part of the campus where the university first began. And uh, I pointed out Hyde Hall. Is that one of your renovations, he asked. And I knew we, we had succeeded. Because this that building was made to look old. It was it was made to fit its context. Affordability. Every year since I've since I've known the university, we've been number one, we've been recognized by Keblinger Personal Finance Magazine as the number one you know, most accessible university in the country, public university. I remember the day that Shirley Ort came to my office, and this is what she said. She told me that UNC was meeting 100% of the need our students were demonstrating through financial aid. And this is, this is what she said. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could promise these students a debt-free graduation? It would only cost you a, a few thousand dollars more than you're currently spending. And that's how the Carolina Covenant was born. That's my most single proudest moment of, 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 of accomplishment. The Covenant was originally set at families at 100% of the federal poverty level, and we quickly discovered that we could raise that to, to 200%. There were many copies at first, but slowly those copies melted away when other universities discovered, discovered how expensive this program was. They just couldn't, they couldn't, they just, they just couldn't find a way to support it. But we 
persisted. Because it's a core value at this university to offer this program of debt-free graduation to someone who's already admitted. There's no special application. 10% of the undergraduate population here at Carolina are covenant scholars. The average GPA, high school GPA, is 4.4. .4. I didn't know you could make more than a 4 point grade point average, but these students do. The program costs $64 million a year. 30% is supported by private funds. But I want to emphasize, these are really smart kids. They are, we don't give them any special break on admission. They have to be admitted the same way all of our students are, are admitted. 50% of these students are in the top 10 of their high school class. Not the top 10%, the top 10 of graduating class. They're really, they're really smart. They add to our academic quality. And I can clearly remember when Shirley told me that we had closed the black achievement gap through the Carolina Covenant program. That was a, that was a great day. Faculty salaries would be a more difficult issue. The low point was reached in 2002 or three when the College of Arts and Sciences lost 60% of their faculty who had offers when UNC made a counter offer, 60%. We were hemorrhaging faculty. And why? Because the state had given us very low increases. We, we had a history of low salaries. And the state and the system were confiscating part of our federally reimbursed Costs of research, informally known as research over research overhead. They called it double dipping. We were getting funds from the state, and we were getting money also from the federal feds to reimburse us for the cost of doing research. Our board of trustees mobilized and formed a political action group, which ultimately became the second largest PAC in the state. It was vociferously opposed by the system, by the board of governors, and by the press, because they, they said, why should Chapel Hill have its own political action group. It was strictly nonpartisan, by the way. We only made to be to be a friend of Carolina, you had to sign on to being supporting the non Carolina's re, retrieval of the full 100 percent of the overhead. The, what, what the federal government was already inadequately reimbursing us, the university for the cost of research. I could give you a primer on, on that, but I, I don't think I need to. 
shortly, uh, briefly, the cost of laboratories are calculated in the cost of, of doing research. And as we, as we built science buildings, the cost, the cost grew because our investment was growing. The PAC was strictly nonpartisan and quickly made a legislator's, legislator's position on UNC's retaining full, fully the overhead receipts as the proxy for being a friend of Chapel Hill and thus meriting the PAC's support. We, will, we, we were nonpartisan. We were strict. We gave to Republicans and Democrats as long as they supported retaining overhead receipts. In 2004, there were no recorded votes in the General Assembly on UNC's retaining full overhead receipts. So we had won that, that battle. That was also the year that the UNC Cancer Hospital was funded. 2004 was, was the beginning of, of, of good times for Carolina. Not only was the Cancer Hospital funded, but the $50 million University Cancer Research Fund was created. Think of that, think of it this way. That's the equivalent of a $1 billion corpus paying 5% a year. $1 billion corpus. I was able to, in 2004, I was able to convince Molly Broad and the Board of Governors to initiate campus-based tuition to support faculty salary. With all the funds from the campus increase going to faculty salaries. The Board of Governors also agreed to set aside funds for need-based aid to hold harmless our most needy students. So that was an enormous victory. I'll come back to that point in a bit. When I left in 2008, faculty salaries were on a par with Michigan, and Virginia, and just below University of California, Berkeley, and UCLA, the four peers that had been identified by John Lombardi when I first came. The major publics, public research universities, advanced to 2014. The Board of Governors adopted a freeze and cap policy, which limited to 15% of, of campus-based tuition that could be used for student aid. That year, UNC was spending 20.9% on student aid, or about 19, less than, 19 million less than the cap. The previous year, UNC had reserved 38% for financial aid. So this was a this was a major blow. The Daily Tar Heel called this an alarming message to send to prospective students, noting that for the 13th time in a row. UNC was 
ranked number one in affordability by Keblinger. This was even this, uh, the Board of Governors even discussed the takers and the, the makers and the takers, referring to needy students as leeches. How disgusting. Shirley Ort and Steve Farmer worried that student debt, debt would skyrocket. The burden was passed to university development, which picked up. I'm so proud of this university because we picked it up. And when the Board of Governors passed it to us, we we rallied and supported. And the, the, co the, the covenant survives to this day because of private support. In addition, the Board of Governors began to end campus-based tuition increases, which were the fuel of faculty salary increases. Now, faculty salaries are hardly competitive, leading to raids from better funded publics and, and private universities. To go to Duke University, a faculty member doesn't even have to change, the, change their zip code. They can just, they can just drive nine miles further and, 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 be, and be well compensated and, not, and have to cheer for the Blue Devils. In 2021, the Hussman School of Journalism announced that Nicole Hannah-Jones was being appointed to a night chair in race and investigative journalism. Appointments to night chairs normally carried tenure, but allegedly a message from the chair of the Board of Trustees Academic Affairs Committee to the chancellor suggested that the board should never have to vote on tenure for Ms. Hannah Jones. They were concerned over the 1619 project. As a result, the administration announced a workaround solution. Nicole Hannah Jones would be appointed to the night chair on a five year contract with an option, with an option for review, but without tenure. By the way, did I mention the firestorm of controversy that erupted from conservative circles about Nicole Hannah Jones even being on the faculty? I, 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 I missed that. It was a, it was a, it was a virtual firestorm. She is. She is controversy, but we have, that's one of the things that makes our faculty so special. We have people who dare to speak the truth, even when the, when the truth is unwanted. When the university announced the workaround, our faculty were outraged. And so a, a second storm of controversy em emerged, which also involved Walter Hussman 
who is the principal donor to the School of Journalism. It's the Hussman School of Journalism, after all. And he's, a, he's an Arkansas journalist. Nicole Hannah-Jones was ultimately granted tenure by the Board of Trustees. But after all the controversy, she, she accepted a professorship at Howard University, leading to the loss of many faculty of color. Faculty who are very reticent about why they left. I find it difficult even to find someone in the administration who will talk about this. One person who refuses to be identified told me that most of the faculty who left had tenure and were in a strong negotiating position. He also said that the, they, were, they were offered only modest retention factors packages, inviting them, inviting them to leave. Paul Fulton's web, website carried this story about faculty exodus at UNC. Faculty are the heart of any university. But what, what has politiz, politicization cost UNC Chapel Hill? Though, though not all these faculty members cited governance as the reason Let's look at some of the recent departures. Kelly Hogan is a rock star in a world of new ways to teach and keep students in, engaged, as is, a, as is her colleague, D.G. Sathi. Hogan is now a, a professor of the practice of biology at Duke University. Suzanne Barber was the dean of the UNC Graduate School, is now the dean of the Duke University Graduate School. Dean Freelon was the founder of the Center for Inter Information Technology and Public Life at UNC. He has been awarded more than $6 million in grants from Knight, Ewell, and others. He is the son of noted architect Phil Freelon, who designed our Stone Center, who also designed the African American, wonderful African American Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington. Obviously, deep ties to North Carolina. He is now the Alan Rand Randall Freelon Sr professor at the Annan School School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, an endowed chair named for his grandfather. Lisa Jones, a renowned African-American biochemist at the University of, Mer of Maryland, Baltimore, whom the university chemistry department had been recruiting for two years withdrew after the Nicole Hannah-Jones debacle. And she, she was not quiet about it. Why? William Sturkey, a history professor focusing on race and the South, was named Distinguished, Prof Distinguished Lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. Sturkey penned an op-ed about the BOT's action to create the school of whatever it's called, skill, and, and the BOT's media campaign the next day on Fox News and the Wall Street Journal. Andrew and Ileana Perrin. Andy Perrin professor of sociology and director of the Institute for Arts and Humanities. Andy Perrin is now a distinguished professor of sociology at Hopkins. And Eliana, who's a, who was a, at Duke University, is Bloomberg professor of primary care 
in Hopkins School of Medicine and Nursing. I will say this about the parents. They only left because Hopkins could put together joint appointments for them. So, but Andy cited in his blog the four levels of governance in the university, at this university, and he, he said uh, the NGA, NCGA, the Board of Governors, the Substantial System Administration, and the Board of Trustees. And I quote, that's a huge oversight structure. With the Republican takeover of the, of the state legislature in 2010, that burdensome weapon, that, that burdensome structure became a partisan weapon. The BOG brazenly interfered in university activities for political reasons, and the Board of Trustees delayed tenure for Nicole Hannah-Jones. He went on. UNC has extraordinary faculty, wonderful students, many of them first generation and low income, and a great global reputation. But all of that is in jeopardy, in large part due to the untenable external governance structure. I don't see how, in the long term, a top-tier university can survive governing boards that are hostile to its goals or legislators determined at once to starve it and politicize it. End of quote. According to a recent survey by the Chronicle of Higher Education, 24% of faculty in North Carolina will seek jobs out of state in the next hiring cycle. 24%. And 58% said they would advise graduate students not to seek jobs in this state because of the political environment. As Chancellor, all of the things I worked for are under threat. Affordability and access, faculty salaries, and the deferred maintenance backlog, backlog is as big or bigger than it was in 2000. But still, I have reason for hope. The first reason is the Coalition for Carolina, a network of over 25,000 alumni, faculty, parents, and friends of the university, which sends weekly newsletters to more than 2 million people. The coalition is led by former trustee Roger Perry, former faculty chair Mimi Chapman, who is here tonight, and Joyce Fitzpatrick, a Raleigh public relations professional and UNC alumna. The second reason for hope is the Governor's Commission on University Governance, co-chaired by former system president Presidents Tom Ross and Margaret Spellings. Among the specific recommendations of, the, of this commission, the Board of Governors should, number one, the Board of Governors should create a new Center for Higher Education Governance to optimize best practices. Two, the North Carolina General Assembly should increase the size of the Board of Governors from 24 to 32 to 36 members to increase geographic, gender, and racial diversity. 
Has it escaped you that not only is the Board of Governors all Republican, but it's almost all male? Three, the NCGA should change the selection progress process for the Board of Governors. The majority party in, in, in the House and the Senate should select 12 members each. The largest minority party in each House should select four members each. That seems fair. It's a it, it, it's a majority dominated board, but with minority members. The North Carolina General Assembly, four, should increase the size of each of the Board of Trustees to 15 in the following manner. Seven members elected by the Board of Governors, four members selected by the NCGA, and four members by the governor. It was when Roy Cooper was elected that the Republicans in the General Assembly took away his appointment power of four members of the Board of Trustees. All because he's a Democrat and a UNC graduate. Five, the terms of the Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees should be increased from four to eight years with no re-election for a second term. Six, all members the meetings of the Board of Governors and the Board of Trustees should be live streamed and recorded. And seven, Lobbyists should have a required cooling off period before serving on a governing board. Very reasonable suggestions. I'm not optimistic that these recommendations, recommendations will be implemented in the short term, given the current political realities. But the commission has given us a roadmap for how to get out of this mess, to get out of the current difficulty. A recent example of the, these realities was in the governor's veto of Senate Bill 512 just the other day, in which the Board of Trustees were, was expanded from 13 to 15, with the General Assembly electing six and the Board of Governors electing eight. The troubles continue. Only time will tell if my cautious optimism is justified. Thank you. Is that the slides were for you. Andy Perrin is bashful on We don't need to see. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, really, absolutely. Uh, it's a it's a look back at the more halcyon days of UNC. Um, we have questions from the audience. Go ahead, Brent. And I will repeat the question quickly. Go ahead, Brent. The question was essentially, what has changed from the time when only Jesse Helms was attacking the university to now it's many people against the university? They believe 
that our liberal faculty basically indoctrinate and corrupt innocent undergraduates. There is no evidence to that fact. But that's what they believe. Hence the uh, statement of the Board of Trustees the next morning after they introduced, they, they blindsided the chancellor and, and the faculty with this proposed school on Fox News suggesting that it's time we hired some right-wing faculty. And the, and the, and the, and the editorial page in, in the Wall Street Journal said the same thing. We had a question back here, um, right here, go ahead. So the question was about the role Hussman played in the controversy over Nicole Hannah-Jones. I think, uh, I think Mr. Hussman played a major role. Uh, he was clearly working behind the scenes uh, with the Board of Trustees. Uh, to, to cause them to not to award tenure. Did he withhold money? I don't think he... I, I, he's never paid his gift. He's never, he's never paid us what he's pledged. Okay, we had a question here. Go ahead. We had... Uh, uh, we've had uh, legislative re relations uh, professionals on our staff for a long time. So a two-part question, do they just simply run into a brick wall when it comes to the usual kind of uh, persuasion that uh, has been successful? And then secondly, tactically, if that doesn't work, if that just will not work, what's the strategy for how for the Coalition for Carolina uh, is it? Is there any substitute other than at the ballot box? Ultimately, I don't think so. I think I think the ballot box is is key. We have to vote these guys out. Um, I just want to ask quickly, Graham, do we have questions from the online audience yet? Okay, I want to remind folks on the online audience if you do have a question, to use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Bill, did you have a question? And then I have one over there as well. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, my, cons my conservative friends say 90% of the faculty at UNC Chapel Hill is liberal. Where does that 90% come from, that figure? That's often used. That's probably true of the, so <laughs> of the social science and humanities faculty, but it's not true of the business school and it's not true of the medical school. So the hard sciences are, are, are much more evenly divided. Uh, the fact is that humanities and social science are, 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 are tilted left. But I don't think there is any indoctrination going on. Contrary. I've always said there's you, you, you can't find people who censor themselves more in front of students than a quote-unquote liberal professor. That's right. Honestly. Um, I know you had a question here. Yeah, I, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm not, and I wish I shared your cautious optimism. I do not. I, I'm not sure, however, that the behavior of the legislature represents the general will of the people. And I think one impediment to them representing the will of the people is gerrymandering. This certainly occurs at the national level and, and may hit North Carolina with a big club soon. But what, to what extent do you think gerrymandering is going to interfere with the ultimate solution, which is at the vote voter's box? Ger I, I agree with you that gerrymandering is a, is a huge issue. And it, it, it distorts the will of the people because uh, I I can't get it. I, 
there is that Supreme Court election that st that really bothers me. We we lost a chance to keep a majority on the Supreme Court of reasonable people, and we 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 blew that. I have a friend. I, obviously, I'm a Democrat. Uh, I, I have a friend who who's now the vice chair of the of the Democratic North Carolina Democratic Party, who says you could throw a dart at at the map of North Carolina and come and only have a fifty percent chance of hitting a county with an effective Democratic Party organization. So I, I'm i a big fan of Anderson Clayton and the, the new chair. I think she's going to, I think she's going to whip things up. Yeah. Uh, Professor McNeil. In your feeling of cautious optimism, does it give you pause when you look at Florida? It it does. It does it give me pause when I look at Florida? Absolutely, because I I think I think that's where our Republicans want to take us. It's where where Florida is. If you'll humor me a question, what role could students have in this whole? trying to affect change. Is there a role for the student body to affect change? I, I think there is. Uh, mobilization, for one, and the students, the students, I don't think, I think the, the students are really on to gun control, for example. Uh, Obviously, they, they they need to be. We had the second second gun in, in incident on this campus today, and we had one only two weeks ago. A first a faculty member was killed. So, it's obviously a very serious issue, and it's and the students, I think, rose up, and 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 they, yesterday in the North Carolina General Assembly. And they, they said, out of here. We need sensible gun control. So I think I'm, that's, that's, that's ultimately my reason for optimism. I think in the long term, by the way, to your question, the people of North Carolina love this university. That was proven in the bond bill. They love the community colleges. We just need to do a better job of telling our story and and working against this awful gerrymandering. And 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 the, and a better day is coming. James, it sounds like we almost need more public-facing organisms at the university, like Carolina Public <laughs> Humanities doing we this do. work. I saw a lot of hands up, so yeah. Is this Charlie? Okay. Actually, you preempted my question to a degree. Who is telling our story? Who is telling the story of the university in, if it's not the university doing a good job itself? Well, I think we could do a better job, but I think the whole communic the, the, uni communications organ of the university is is doing that. Uh, are they doing it as all they could? I think the I think one of the hands one of the hands is being held behind their back by the by the governing board boards. Graham, do we have any questions from the online audience yet? Okay. We have a question over here. You know what? I'm going around with the microphone. It's working. Dr. Mesa, regarding the uh, governance issue, I've heard it said that a key to uh, effecting change is for not just UNC Chapel Hill, Chapel Hill campus, but to ally with the other 
uh, university system campuses to try to bring pressure on uh, the legislature, the other powers that be, and the public to affect change, and that that effort has been made from UNC leadership, uh, and I suppose through the coalition, without much response from the other campuses. I think that's probably true. Uh, my biggest disappointment, candidly, in, inside this room is North Carolina State University. Uh, they're admittedly more conservative than we are, but they should be concerned. They, they have research scientists, for example, who want to work on climate change. And, 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 and I, I just worry about them. I don't think they're fully on, on board. We have a question from none other than Lloyd Kramer. So I um, actually have a historical question <laughs> as to how you would compare the relations between the legislature, the governing boards, and the leadership of the university today with the era when Bill Friday was in the leadership of the university system. That's a question. And the other question is, do you think this dichotomy between the humanities and the sciences that you describe is in fact changing because many of our colleagues in the sciences now feel under threat um, because vaccine research, because yeah. climate change, because scientific knowledge is at risk in the same way that knowledge might be in uh, the history of black people in North Carolina. In other yeah. words, everybody has a stake. Two, two problems. What do you think of that? I'll, I'll deal with the second one first. Um, I wish my colleague Holden Thorpe was here, were here because he, 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 he speaks eloquently about science and the, and the, and the fact that Science tells the truth. It tells unvarnished truth. And these guys don't like the truth. Um, by the way, things were all, uh, weren't always good with the Democrats in charge. I loved Mark Basnight. But I had many difficult conversations on the phone with Mark about admissions and East Carolina wanting to play, wanting us to play football. Uh, he, he, it was not always a pretty picture. Can you speak to the uh, Bill Friday part of Lloyd's question there about those days and what might be different? I, I could give you a, a, a different picture about Bill Friday, too. Uh, Bill Friday was a control freak. Bill Friday wanted to control everything. Uh, Bill Friday loved Chapel Hill. That's true. And that's good. But he loved it too much. Uh, he's responsible, in my mind, for the control that general administration has over us today. So, I'm not a big Bill Friday fan. Yeah, um, yes, I, um, uh, to partially at least go go to the question about Bill Friday. I was I was dean of the law school in yeah. the, in the 80s. And Bill Friday was president of of the university and we knew where the power was, but one of the things that was remarkably different, it's not just that the legislature, the general assembly was predominantly overwhelmingly democratic. It was overwhelmingly filled with our graduates. That's right. Uh, it was overwhelmingly filled with law school graduates, mm -hmm. but 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 graduates of 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 the university, 
and uh, even even the Republicans in uh, in that's those right. days uh, were close to the close to the university, and that's one of the dynamics. Now, the the I don't have an answer of of, of how to change that, but but I think that there is a lack of willingness of our best and brightest coming out of the law school or coming out of other uh, parts of the of the university to say, hey, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to run for the state legislature. That's right. Uh, they're not doing that these the, these days. I can't say as I would blame. Them. I wouldn't either. But 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 I think that that's that's a realistic part of it, and that's part of what the dynamics are. It's not just party. Party is part. No, of it, that's right. It's not just party. It's all very true. I'm going to get that on the microphone. <laughs> Go ahead. You got a guy named Jim Blaine, who's a Carolina graduate, who was um, Berger's chief of staff, who just got put on the board of trust. He's been behind all these policies. He was advising the president of the UNC system. So he's crafting, even though he's a Chapel Hill graduate, he actually has on his website, he was told not to come back. But he is back and he's going to be a trustee. And he is driving a lot of that policy. Tim Moore is also a Carolina graduate. He's not doing anything to stop this. A lot of the people are his appointees. So it is not just about having graduates, but it's about having people in office who value public education, period. Because right. we're seeing it at the university level, but the destruction is also happening from pre-K through 12. And a question here? Uh, very quickly, if if I have things right, substantial investment has been occurring during your period and following from corporations moving to North Carolina yeah. and population growth. I've not heard any reference to leveraging corporates in order to improve the situation. Could you please comment? I think that's a corporate corporate support, corporate influence is positive and should be exploited by this university. Is it growing? I don't think so. I don't think it's to the extent that, that we might wish uh, it to be so. I, I, I think that's, a, that's, a, a, that's an opportunity missed. Further questions for Dr. James Meeser? Okay, Miriam, I have a question up here. How much do you think the academic, or sorry, the athletic slash academic scandal that was during Holden's tenure and carried into Carol Fultz's tenure, and, and how much do you think now our, you know, our preoccupation with that, and now the culture war language that we have going on, ex example, Hannah um, Jones, right? Nicole Hannah Jones, that thing. How much do you think that has distracted us from the whole idea of further growth of the campus and the strengthening of the academic foundations of UNC? That's a very good question. Uh, the athletic scandal destroyed Holden career, Holden's chancellorship. It did. Uh, he was a he was a very bright light, whom I encouraged Erskine Bulls to appoint. By the way. Um, and I was, I, it turns out that he should have been a provost first. I didn't see that. And I, 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 I'm partly responsible for his crash. So I, 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 I he's, he's done, he, he's revived himself and he's, obviously thriving today and Jim was just telling me telling me about a, a great speech he gave to the Chapel, 
hold an unleashed. <laughs> uh, I have an enormous regard and respect for him. He's a he's a really bright light, and and he's well placed. He has a bully pulpit as editor in chief of Science Magazine for the whole country, and I think he's well placed. Is that just return to the culture issues as yeah, a distraction? It's it may it, it may be a factor. I, I, this university was damaged by it by that epoch, for sure. But I think we've moved on from that. My sense is it's 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 not related to the culture wars. So much. I have a question here. Yes, I uh, take issue with your comment about the uh, tragedy being Holden Thorpe's. I can recall attending a uh, faculty meeting as a uh, advisor to the AAUP some years ago uh -huh. uh, when Butch uh, Davis' salary came up, and uh, we were told that the doubling of the salary. Uh, was entirely justified because we weren't going back to leather helmets. Uh, do you recall that exchange? Chancellor I don't. Music? I don't. It was tears in my mind. <laughs> you clearly remember this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because that was the beginning of all of our football troubles. Yeah. With NIL. Do we have any qu further questions for Dr. James Meiser? Chancellor Meiser, thank you for your service to the university, and thank you for all you've done today you. for us. And, um, and I want to thank all of you for coming, and if you would like, I would just want to take just one moment before we go to let you know about some upcoming programs that we're very excited about. First of all, if you like coming here on Wednesday afternoons, keep coming, because we'll be doing Humanities in Action. Next week, we have, our, we have a full list here. It's on page, oh, this is, I should have had this open. It's on page four of our, uh, of our um, brochure here. Please grab one on your way out if you don't have one. And next week is the Propagandist Playbook, How Search is Manipulated for Political Gain uh, with Francesca Tripodi uh, from the School of Information and Library Science. But you'll take a look. We have wonderful topics all through the, the semester. However, do not come here for Humanities in Action on the last Wednesday of every month because we are restarting our Flyleaf Books music program, um, which is really one of us. Education is about 30%, excuse me, about 70% doing the uh, music and performance and about 30% learning about the, the artist, learning about the music. And we start with Juan Alamo on September 27th. We have uh, Grammy-nominated and very, very popular singer-songwriter Don Landis on October 25th, and jazz vocalist and uh, guitarist Kate McGarry and Keith Gans on November 29th. We have a great time. Please consider coming out to the music programs. We also have special programs with the Ackland Museum coming up. We still have some seats left with art and literature at the Ackland. It's a it's a book group where we'll be reading Rousseau and also taking a look at their wonderful collection of prints that they have on. And if you haven't, just go to the Ackland and check out the prints. They're absolutely fantastic anyway. I also want to remind you folks of our um, weekend seminars coming up. We have Gerhard Weinberg. Yes, Gerhard Weinberg is doing another World War II program with us. <laughs> Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt on Saturday, September 23rd. And a special program. Um, listen, I'm going to try to pull your heartstrings. you got to come to this one. It's going to be really fun. It's art, music, and the aesthetics of power in early modern Europe. This is a dinner time program where we're going to have um, Tanya String talking about art history from the early modern age, and then we're going to have performance on period pieces, uh, and that'll be uh, uh, after dinner, and that's on Friday, September 29th. Please sign up for our website if you, have, uh, if you haven't already. Sign, excuse me, our email list. Uh, get our brochure, and of course, check out humanities.unc.edu. Oh, I, I forgot one other program. This is very important, and I just want to say because it's got a really, um, really uh, local uh, ring to it. This is a free program on September 19th at the Chapel Hill Public Library, Langston Hughes, 1931, Visit to Chapel Hill, the Scottsboro Case, and Legal Lynching. That should be wonderful. 
And we also have uh, Beth Gardner is organizing these really awesome programs called uh, Biodiversity Garden Parties. I'll be able to be announcing these coming up. These are wonderful events with humanists and scientists talking about the importance of biodiversity. Check us out, humanities.unc.edu. We would uh, love to see you at more of our programs. And thank you for coming today. One more hand, one more time. Put your hands together for James Meeser. Stand up here. There we go. James Meeser, everybody. Thank you for your service. We will see everyone next time. Thank you so much.